Mark 12, 13 to 17. <clears throat> and they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in your Son. We thank you for the wisdom, the glory, all that he radiated in his earthly life, showing the world about you. We thank you that you've revealed yourself in your word to us. We pray that as we spend the next moments looking at it, we pray that you would show us yourself, give us an accurate depiction of, of you, what you have done, what you want to do in and through us. And we pray that you would help us to Put ourselves in a position of being under your word to, to hear, to learn, to receive, and to respond. We ask that you would aid us in all of that by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take a seat. You can do that now. <clears throat> so at this point, Jesus is in his final week of ministry. Uh, before going to the cross. And now it's starting to see as things are, seems as though things are really ramping up. Lots of events taking place. Um, we had the triumphal entry. We had Jesus going in and cleansing the temple. Last week, we heard about his authority being challenged by the, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And this, this challenging, this questioning of Jesus uh, is going to continue on for a certain period of time. So he was challenged directly in his authority in, in last week's passage. This week, there'll be a different approach, but there'll continue to be challenges and, and questioning of Jesus to come after that. But here today, we see this challenge come, and it's somewhat different to the preceding passage. As I say, these, these um, challenges came in different forms, they, they came from different people, and we'll see that as we continue to work through the next chapter or so. <clears throat> so our text there, we began with reading, and they sent him. Now, immediately that gives us a question, which is, who's, who's they? Now, to answer that, we'll have to cast our minds back to either last week's sermon, or you can cast your eyes back to the preceding passages. I mean, chapter 11 Verse 27, we see that it's the chief priests, the scribes, and, and the elders of the Jews, some of them. And so Jesus had just told this parable that was an absolute denouncing of, of the chief priests and scribes and elders. And all of this was done in the sight of the people. And so as we saw at the end of the text last week, they, they were seething. Um, in, in Luke's account, he tells us that they sought to lay hands on him from that hour. So things were really starting to heat up at this point. And having received this public dressing down, they weren't going to challenge him directly this time. They had to be more tactful in their approach. So they sent someone. Now the, the pairing of people that they send is, a, is an unlikely alliance, to say the least. When we see the chief priests and the scribes together, we think nothing of it because they're essentially on the same team. They've got the same uh, goals in mind. 
That was not the case at all with the Pharisees and the Herodians. Um, it's amazing to see the forces that will unite when coming against God and, and coming against the things of God. Just a quick background of those, those two groups of people. Um, firstly, the Pharisees, who were, were fairly well acquainted with them. They were the, the separated ones, they, they referred to themselves as. They were the, the religious elite. They were the creme de la creme of, of all that was holy and right and virtuous in the eyes of the Jewish people. They had come out of um, a time of bondage and captivity. And so they wanted to reestablish the Jewish identity. They wanted to reestablish what they deemed to be the, the ways of God. And so they were about Israel. They loathed Roman rule. And as soon as the yoke of Rome could be lifted from their shoulders, they were all for it and they would be ready as long as it was safe for them to, to participate. The Herodians, on the other hand, different group of people. They were not Jewish. Um, they were named for Herod, of course. Um, as you read in the, in the Gospels, you see quite a few Herods and it can get a little bit confusing because you see King Herod ruling when Mary and Joseph are traveling to Bethlehem. But then it says Herod died and they then came to, back to um, Israel. But then we see other Herods, like Herod that killed John. So that's his son. So he was ruling in this area. And then afterwards, he sort of divided his kingdom and, and set his sons here and, here and there. So in the north, you had Herod Antipas that had killed John the Baptist. And in the south, the, the Romans ended up coming in and placing a governor of theirs, the governor that we all know as Pontius Pilate. Now, the Herodians, as I said, were not Jews. They were a, they were a dynasty. The Herods were a dynasty of uh, the Edomites. And so they didn't worship the God of Israel. Politically speaking, they were loyal to Rome. They were on good terms with them. And they were going to do anything to maintain that relationship. They want to keep the door open for future favor and opportunity. So <clears throat> this... Um, Coming together of the Herodians and the Pharisees was, was an odd thing. They didn't agree on religion, on the one hand. They certainly didn't agree on politics. And as I said, it's, it's, an, amazing, it's, ama it's an amazing thing, the sort of people that will band together when coming against Jesus, when coming against Christians. Maybe you've experienced that yourself on a more personal level with, with old friends or with um, unbelieving family members where they don't really have anything in common. But when it comes to undermining your faith, um, they're ready and willing to join together in, in deriding your faith, in, in undermining the way you parent the chil your children. Why, do you, why are you doing this this way? Why are, you, why are you spending your money this way? You didn't used to be like that. And this is something that, that we ought to be aware of. Um, it shouldn't strike us as, as odd when these kind of alliances rear their heads in, in our lives. When, when obstacles are laid before us in our pursuit of godliness, or if a ministry opportunity is something that we want to sink our teeth into, we shouldn't be shocked if something or somebody crops up. In fact, we should, we should expect it. So <clears throat> this unholy alliance here, they sought to trap Jesus, as we saw in the text. And it says that they sought to do so, catching him in his words. If you look at verse 13, it says, trap. They sought to trap him in his talk. And this was a pretty thorough and, and thought out plan. Because Jesus had been speaking and preaching publicly for a period of time, they thought that they were bound to have the opportunity to trip him up, to catch him in his words, to find contradictions, to find errors in his logic, to find something that would, would discredit him in the eyes of the people. I was listening to a public person the other day that had, that's come under fire from various quarters. And he was speaking on this issue of being in the public eye, uh, particularly in a speaking capacity. And he was remarking on how somebody that is a, a, a public speaker that, uh, that is in the public eye, they have to be careful with their words um, so as to not contradict, to not say something inappropriate and out of turn. <clears throat> 
to not um, say something that's inaccurate and discredit himself. And I mean, that's that's a good thing for us to consider. I mean, we see the book of Proverbs and how much it talks about the use of our words and speaking too much and when to speak, when not to speak. Uh, a few Proverbs, uh, chapter 10, verse 19 says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Proverbs 21, 23 says, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Well, how about Proverbs 29, 20? Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. And there are many more of those. Now, of course, Jesus was not guilty of speaking too much. Now, being that he was the embodiment of, of the wisdom of all of these proverbs, um, they weren't going to trip him up that way. He wasn't you or I. He wasn't the, the public speaker that I just referenced. And he certainly wasn't who the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Herodians hoped he would be. Somebody that they could ensnare. And by me, were they about to discover that? It says that they sought to catch him. Some of your versions might say they sought to entrap him. Now, the word there in the original language, it has a picture of, of a trap, sort of in the wild, in the wilderness, to, to catch a beast. Now, I'm not going to pretend to know about hunting. Um, as a city slicker, I know less of hunting than I do hoovering. Uh, but I do know there's a certain amount of premeditation that goes into hunting, a certain amount of planning, method. You don't just go waltzing up to a creature and try and grab it and then the next moment it's on your wall. Obviously, there's, there's premeditation, there's a method. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to track. If this thing happens, then this is what I'll do and so on and so forth. And that's all captured in this word that's used. And we see that it's the case by the craftiness of, of the inquiry that they bring. Now, to fully appreciate the nature of the climate that Jesus existed in, it's worth us considering um, a few things historically and culturally. It was a sensitive situation in which the Jews found themselves under Roman rule. Uh, the Romans were relatively tolerant as ancient empires went. Typically, an empire would come in, lay the place to waste, install their own gods, have the people worship them and do away with the others and, and be done with it. The Romans, they would come in, yes, they would put the boot on the neck, and yes, they would bring some of their own uh, gods along, but they would allow them to keep some, and they had this sort of syncretistic um, approach. <clears throat> and it's hard for us to, to understand the way some of these things went. When we think of religion, we think of something that comes with a worldview, uh, an ethic for all of life, something that our decisions in life are, are informed by, something that that shapes our identity. Whereas back then it was more sort of cultic worship. So you pay your due to the priest or whoever, you declare your allegiance, maybe you attend some ceremony. Um, it's just a, a tip of the hat to the cultural tradition because the, the, the national identity was bound up in the worship of the gods. So when you... Um, worships one of these gods or burn the incense or whatever it was, you were showing your loyalty to the state. Now, this turned out to be a bit of a problem when it came to the Jews because that was not the way they did things. They were, they were sons of Abraham, after all. They were Israelites, governed by God, not governed of man, much less some pagan Gentile dogs like the Romans in their eyes. And so the Romans had to get used to dealing um, with the Jews. They were used to quelling um, unrest in their community. If we re recall Acts chapter 5, there's a time when the apostles um, are at large and the Pharisees are talking about what they're going to do to deal with them. Should we put them away? Should we um, have them killed? Should we jail them and what have you? And we see uh, Gamaliel, it's in chapter 5, verses 34 to 39. You don't have to turn there, but just for reference. And he stands up and says, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, 
Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. And he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Now, as I say, that was in the future. And we go into Acts 16, we see Paul and Silas getting flogged. At this point, they're outside of Israel, but it's for this same issue. They've upset the local cultural norms with their um, casting out demons. And so it's within this context that they come to Jesus with this question. Now look at, the, look at the slippery talk of the Pharisees there in the first part of verse 14. They say, teacher, and we, could, we can stop there. That, that term teacher, rabbi, that they addressed him with, that was a sign of, of, of real respect. Having come out of captivity, the monarchy was not allowed to be reestablished. So the top of the pile in society was the likes of the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees. And so when somebody approached somebody with the word teacher, they were showing deference. They were, they were showing honor to them and expecting something to come from their mouth that they ought to receive and that they were ready to receive. So they come saying, teacher, we know that you are true. We do not care about anyone's opinion. Now they don't mean he's, he's not thoughtful or inconsiderate. It's talking about being swayed to or fro by other people's opinions, their opinions of you and what you're saying. He says, you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Now, this is some real um, fork-tongued speech. The feigning respect, the pretending to be in admiration of, of Jesus' manner, of his characteristics and his ministry, the letting on that they held him and his teaching in high regard. I mentioned a moment ago how the, how the scriptures are full of exhortations and, and admonitions regarding speech. Well, a good deal of those are to do with flattery. And when it comes to flattery, it's always the denouncing of it that we see in scriptures. Just dishonest, self-serving, disingenuous. And the Lord, the Lord detests it. And, and he says as much throughout the scriptures. And here they are in the presence of the Lord, in the flesh. And they're trying to flatter him. And this is worm tongue caliber rhetoric here. Oh, wise teacher, you're so above being swayed by others and their uninformed opinions of you. You only teach what is in accordance with God's law. There is no error in your teaching. Now, <clears throat> all that they were saying was correct. It was, it was as accurate as could be. How perverse and, and how tragic that they didn't believe the words that were coming out of their mouths. This was, this was the ep epitome of hypocrisy. The literal uh, rendering of the word hypocrite was to do with somebody that wore a mask, a mask that hides what's really behind, a mask that hides the, the true motives, the true character of a person, the true thoughts of an individual. And this is as clear, as a, uh, clear an example of hypocrisy as you'll ever see. Now they engage in all of this to, to set themselves up for the question that they're about to ask. If you look at the last couple of sentences there in verse 14, they ask, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them? Or should we not? Now, this is an insincere inquiry. But you're starting to see more of the significance now, I think, of, of the two parties that came along hand in hand to try and trip Jesus up. Clearly, they are on opposite sides of this debate. But that doesn't matter to them because they want to see Jesus go down. Now, just a quick explanation of, of this tax. Some of, some of your versions might say poll tax, and, and that's what it was. It was an imperial tax 
um, for the emperor's treasury. It was typically paid using a, a denarius, which is the coin Jesus asked for, which was roughly a day's wage <clears throat> for a soldier, a laborer, something like that. Now, it was a source of much contention, this, this tax. Some zealots refused to pay it because they saw it as um, legitimizing Roman rule. Uh, the Pharisees paid it begrudgingly, and the Herodians paid it happily because they were strong supporters of Rome. Now, this is a little bit difficult for us in our day to appreciate, I think. I mean, we're in, we live in the country that is the greatest superpower in the world. Don't tread on me and all of that. It's St. Patrick's Day weekend. Imagine we were 100 years ago in Ireland and uh, they were under British rule. And every time they had to pay a tax, it was, it was a finger in the eye of them. It struck at their ethnic pride and their cultural heritage. It was the same, same thing here. Because the paying of a tax shows subservience. It shows a submission to an authority. So in paying this tax, I am submitting to you, king, Caesar, government, whatever form that may take. I am acknowledging your rule, your authority. And so I'm paying you what you are requiring me to pay. Now that's one thing in our day. It's difficult whenever anybody reaches for your wallet. But in this day, the emperor was seen as divine in a certain sense. The coin that, that Jesus asked them to bring had the, the image of the emperor on one side, but had the inscription, Tiberius Augustus Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. So Tiberius was the emperor, and his father was Augustus, who they believed to be divine, despite the fact that he died and stayed dead. Apparently he was divine. So this question is being asked of Jesus, a Jew, a rabbi in front of a crowd of Jews with Pharisees and scribes present, with the Herodians present, waiting for his answer, ready to rush off to Pilate and, and give the report, depending on his answer. Now, I don't want to overdo this point about the delicate nature of the situation, but this is, this is a tense moment in which they're asking this question. It would only be decades from, from this time that a man would lead an uprising that, that would be put down but would ultimately um, lead to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And according to the Jewish historian Josephus, it would largely have to do with an issue of tax. <clears throat> and remember, after, after his arrest, Jesus was accused of undermining Caesar's rule. Uh, Luke 23 verses 1 and 2 say, Then the assembly rose as a body, and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. So Jesus is in this position, somebody that has put himself forth as the Messiah that God has sent, and a Jewish Messiah was about unlikely, as unlikely as any character to to sanction Roman rule. It would cause an outcry in the Jewish community. But if he took a strong stand against Rome, he would find himself in an even more precarious situation. So you can see the conundrum that was, that was laid before Jesus. But be not dismayed. Look at Jesus' response. As, as we read, as we, as we read the text together, Jesus saw straight through it. The flattery and the falsehood could, could not be hidden from him. He knew their hypocrisy. You can't hide falsehood from Jesus. You can't hide false motive from the Lord. He knows, he knows your every thought before it enters your mind. So he asks them, why put me to the test? In Matthew's account of this same event, he records that Jesus flatly calls them hypocrites. Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Now, they're not quite the words that they had imagined Jesus would come out with, with their, with their clever trap that they had set. But he has more to say, and it doesn't, it doesn't get any better for them. Look at the last sentence in verse 15. He says, bring me a denarius 
denarius, excuse me, and let me look at it. And they brought one. Now do note um, how even though it was them that had been sent and they had slyly come to him to, to try and publicly defeat him in a battle of the wits, Jesus has them doing his bidding. He doesn't say, here's a denarius. He says, bring me a denarius. And so they go and they bring it. They happily go along with, with what he's saying, thinking that they're on the verge of undoing him, perhaps. And as, as was often Jesus' way, he answered their question with another question. He asks, whose likeness and inscription is this? Now, before we rush along in our thoughts, oh, it's just the head on the coin and the inscription that goes with it, like, like Washington and In God We Trust and so on and so forth. But there's, more, there's much more going on here in Jesus' question. His choice of words are designed to call something to mind to the, to the people that were listening to him. So upon hearing Jesus say, whose likeness and inscription is this? Whose image is this? The first century Jewish mind would have gone back to the first chapter of Genesis, specifically to chapter 27. He created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Some of you will be familiar with the New City Catechism. And, and the fourth question is, how and why did God create us? And the children's answer is, God created us male and female, in his own image. <clears throat> Why? To glorify him. The pinnacle of God's creation was man, because it was man alone that was created in God's image, created to glorify him, created to reflect something of his character, of his nature. Now that image is, of course, marred due to sin, but we are still creatures of our creator. Who is the creator and who is the creature? You could ask, who owes whom? Who answers to whom? We exist to glorify our maker. So Jesus is, is playing on this idea as he calls their attention to what's on the denarius. Whose image and inscription, he asks. So they respond, Caesar's. Now, of course, they were correct. The coin bore the image of the emperor, as we said. It had the inscription of Tiberius, the son of Augustus. And so Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Who's on the money? Whose currency is it? The word, the word there for, for render has the meaning of to give back, to give of obligation, of duty. It was Caesar's economy. It was his currency. It was the benefits of Rome that they enjoyed in having that money, in being able to use it, in the aqueducts that they had that brought them water. The roads that they had that made their traveling easier, that allowed them to communicate in a better way. The services, the legal system that they had, the Pax Romana, this relative peace that they lived in. It's not a big deal to us, perhaps, because we live in times of peace, but that kind of stability was something you would be happy to pay a little bit of money to keep that. Now, <clears throat> notice what Jesus did here, though, to bring the point home with the inquisitors. As I said, he doesn't go into his own pocket or coin bag or whatever it was. He asks them, and so they come. You're walking round with that coin on your person. You're using the emperor's legal tender. You're enjoying the benefits of the em empire, so you owe him. Now, there's a message here for us as well, which we'll come to mom momentarily. But what, what a spanner that has been thrown in the works. A, a wrench, excuse me. All of a sudden, the Herodians have no report to rush back with. What wisdom Jesus showed here. This, this last w week or two as I've been um, working through this text, so many times I just had to stop just in wonder at Jesus and his wisdom, thinking of some of the, the great things that, that Solomon did when they brought the, the babies before him and, and 
try to garner some wisdom and a decision from him. And, and, and as amazed as the people were then, that paled in comparison to, to the wisdom that Jesus showed here. So let us, let us take that as, as a reason just to worship him. Um, at this moment, <clears throat> Charles Spurgeon said, Had these men guessed the use to which Jesus would put the denarius, they would not have so quickly procured one for him. They bought their own confusion with that coin. They would never afterwards be able to look upon the tribute money without remembering how they were foiled in their attempt to entangle the hated Nazarene. And I think Spurgeon is, is on the money there, if you'll excuse the pun. <clears throat> now, of course, rendering to Caesar was just, was just one part of Jesus' saying here. And as profound as it was, it was not the most significant part. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. So the, the rendering to Caesar ought to always be interpreted in light of Render to God the things that are God's. Um, Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All that's on the earth, plants, trees, animals, you and I, Caesar, the government, they belong to the Lord, those who dwell therein. The prophet Daniel says that he, speaking of God, changes times and seasons and he removes kings and he sets kings up. The same prophet also says in chapter 4 that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will. So the Lord is sovereign over every form of government. Of this render to Caesar, render to God statement, D.A. Carson says the following. Jesus' famous utterance means that God always trumps Caesar. We may be obligated to pay taxes to Caesar, but we owe everything, our very being, to God. Now they thought he was bound to answer in a way that would paint him as either a traitor or an insurrectionist. And this snare that the Pharisees and Herodians had set was just, was just lying there empty on the ground, as it were. And they would have been eating humble pie were it not for the fact that their jaws were slack, open, in astonishment at Jesus' response to them. The end of our text says, and they marveled at him, full stop. Luke says, um, and marveling at him, they became silent. So Jesus evades, evades this conniving trap that they set. <clears throat> and, and Jesus was not seeking to scheme his way out with, with crafty and political words here. He was more than willing to confront people. I mean, we saw him cleanse the temple, but he was, more, he was more than willing to confront people when he needed to. He referred to this Herod as a fox. Now, that doesn't mean, Herod, you're clever like a fox. In, in, in the Jewish mind in that day, if you compared a fox, there was, there was a comparison of a fox to a lion. A lion was the true authority, the power. A fox was a lesser creature. So when Jesus calls Herod a fox, he's saying, you're just a, you're just a client king. The, the emperor, the governor, they're the ones with power. You're a fox. So he clearly wasn't being cowed by, by the pressure of the day. When he does eventually come to be before Pilate, he, Pilate's saying, why don't you do this? Why don't you respond to me? Don't you realize the authority that I have? And Jesus plainly tells Pilate, the most powerful man in the land at that time, to his face, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. That's nerve. Jesus was not afraid to, to settle scores or to, to say whatever needed to be said. The image on a coin, how about, how about the image of the invisible God, as Colossians 1 tells us? It also says that, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
So how do we take this, this saying of his, which is for everyone to obey, how do, we, how do we obey this? There's been disagreement on this through the years. So I'll just say a few things that are not being said by Jesus here. Jesus is not being ironic when he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. There are some that have said, so, well, what, sees, what's, what belongs to God? Everything. So that means we don't give anything to Caesar, of course. Problem with that is, if, if we're going to say Jesus is being ironic, we're going to have to start accusing Paul in his writings to the church about authority as being ironic. We're going to have to say the same about Peter. So that interpretation is obviously not going to work. Another thing that he's not saying is some things are under God's jurisdiction and some things are not. Maybe that wouldn't come out of our mouths, but I've heard believers say similar sorts of things, perhaps about different areas of life, like time, for instance. Well, I have God's time, which is, you know, church services, maybe the odd devotional that I'll do here and there. But outside of that, that's, that's my time. Oh, yes, the, the age-old biblical doctrine of me time. Um, our time that we would be rendering to God is not restricted to Sunday gatherings or meetings or, or quiet time. What about the time that you use to, to teach and correct your child or the time that you use most of your week to work your job? The time and, and the stewardship that you have for, for the health that God has given you? Are you doing it with a worshipful attitude? Are you doing it with a, with a heart full of thanksgiving? With, with thanksgiving on your lips. If you are, then you are rendering that to God. We have a funny way of, of dividing things up when we think of rendering to God and then rendering to other things. We render all things to God. Any separate categories like, like rendering to Caesar exists under our rendering to God. And functionally, we fall into this trap with, with finances, for example. Well, how do I understand finances in terms of rendering to God? Well, my rendering to God is my tithe and my giving, giving to missions. Everything outside of that is sort of neutral. No. If you pay your mortgage, if you pay for, for a roof to be over the head of your children, doesn't, doesn't 1 Timothy 5 say that he that doesn't care for the needs of his family, doesn't provide for them, is worse than an unbeliever? And so in doing so, you are carrying out an act of worshipful obedience to God. Now, <clears throat> perhaps we don't often think of paying the mortgage or getting groceries as, 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 a, as a worshipful experience, but, but we ought to because we're rendering to God when we do those things if we're doing them in a right spirit. Of course, we are rendering, rendering to God when, when we give sacrificially, when we give to missions and all those things. And all those things are worthy and they are certainly part of our rendering to God, the things that are God. But the point is, we ought to be viewing everything as an opportunity to render to God the things that are God's. <clears throat> and this, of course, necessarily includes our honoring and obeying the government. I mentioned that Paul had something to say about believers and the government. So we'll look at that. Romans 13, verses 1 to 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment from the government. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also 
pay taxes. For the authorities or ministers of God attending to this very thing, pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. And honour to whom honour is owed. Now, clearly, Paul is not imagining the government to be some holy institution that is sold out to doing the will of God. And he's speaking in, in, in general terms of the way the Lord raises up government for our good, for stability. If we went and spent a week in a country where the government had fallen and, and, and martial law was the thing, we'd, we'd be crying to get back to the States <laughs> pretty quickly. So it's a good, a good thing. And, and we are to be subject to our rulers, but we're subject to God first. They subsist in him. And, and we can't get this uh, the wrong way around. Just this week, I heard a, a Chinese uh, bishop, <coughs> a Bishop Jianping, and he said, we, as citizens of the country, should first be a citizen and then have religion and beliefs. No, that's wrong. When, when the state starts telling the church what it can and can't do, when it starts telling the preachers what they can and can't say or read, then we've got a problem and we must obey God. We must follow the example of Peter and the apostles. You remember when they were preaching and they'd been imprisoned in, in Acts chapter 5, it says that they were brought before the council and the high priest asked them, did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with his doctrine. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, Oh yeah, we forgot to render to Caesar what was Caesar's. Now they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now that's not an opt-out card for us when the government does something that, that we don't like. Well, I feel that the government is uh, a little bit tyrannical on this point, so I won't obey them in this particular area. Or this, this tax is unreasonable. You know how long it takes to fill out the, the refund form? I won't pay it. Or something that we, we hear, taxation is theft. Well, you can, you can say that all you want, but if Jesus said to render to Caesar, if Paul said to pay the taxes to whom taxes are owed, if Peter said to be subjected um, to the authorities for the Lord's sake, to those human institutions, what choice do we have? What action do we take? We think of the, what our taxes are used for, the, the benefits that they bring we looked at how it was for them in that day. We see our relative safety. We see our military. We see the prosperity, the freedom, and these things that, that we enjoy. Now, is the government perfect? No, obviously not. Is our money squandered as we tax it many times? Yes. But it is our duty to the nation that God has placed us in. And in so doing, we are submitting to God in that act. And, and what about Jesus and Paul's day? Was it worse than than how we have it, the Romans, the pagan Romans, where unwanted children were just left on, on the rubbish heap. Maybe we carry out some of the, a, a more sophisticated form of that particular sin. But the things that happened in, in the Roman Empire, we have it good compared to the early church. We have it good compared to most of our brothers and sisters in the world now and for all of history. We owe the tax that we pay in this sense that Jesus is talking about. <clears throat> now, though Caesar brought certain benefits and was due certain honor and obligation, he was not due worship. That was reserved for God alone. And so a lesson for us is we not all place our security in government or any of the institutions that arise from it, such as the military. Um, we might not be tempted to make a statue of Washington or Uncle Sam or whatever, but if we start to, to find our primary identity in our citizenship, or if we start to come unglued when, when, when the civil institutions are starting to take turns that we, that we don't like, if that happens, something is amiss, and we've started to render to Caesar the things that are God's. 
it has been the temptation of God's people at various times and in, in various places to say, well, since we live in a godless country, in a godless kingdom, we'll just withdraw from society. Or since we live in a godless age and the government is not about the kingdom of God, then why bother getting married and having children and, and thinking multi-generationally? That's happened throughout the ages, and we saw it with the Jews when they were in captivity. But the Lord moved the prophet Jeremiah to, to speak to him on that issue. In chapter 29, verses 4 to 7, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. And so this is the course that we take until Jesus' return. One of honoring the state and one of ultimate obedience to God knowing that the world hated Christ before it hated us. He warned his disciples of this, did he not, in, in John chapter 15. And not that we will do this perfectly, but mercifully, graciously, Christ, when he came to carry out his earthly ministry, he rendered to God all that was due to him on our behalf. When he came to seek and save the lost, he held nothing back. He rendered all, and because of that, we have been made children of him. Now, if you're, if you're not a believer, you are still an image bearer of God. As Jesus asked, who is on the coin, looking for the answer, Caesar, we can ask any person, whose image do you bear? The image of the triune God. Now, if you choose to suppress that, to stuff that down, <clears throat> that God is a fearful God to be reckoned with. Scripture says that it is a fearful thing to fall in the hand, into the hands of a living God. His vengeance is unthinkable. But if you turn to him in faith, all that God, all that Jesus rendered to the Father, all the benefits that come with that, all the blessings, sonship, being with him in glory, they will be yours as well. In... Um, Colossians, it says, For in him, as Jesus, the whole fullness of de deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. And in him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, the spiritual rulers and authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him and we will stand with him in glory the image that is marred now will be fully restored and all that we will do is to render to god the things that are god's before his throne with the seraphim with the angels and every being that he has restored no government to oppose that no sin on our part to lead us away from that or hinder us in our worship what a hope that we have Let's pray.